Welcome to Muffin Talk. You're and welcome to Muffin Talk. This program is brought to you by the initiative Titi Paunamu Study and Joy. Today we have a special broadcast. This will be the last broadcast on the radio. But don't worry, Muffin Talk will continue to be available online. We will continue to invite a guest once a week for an interview. And uh, while it was not an easy decision to cancel the radio program, but with most of my listeners tuning in online, I think it is time for them to have the choice to listen or to listen and watch if they like. So please continue to be tuned in on www.studyjoy.nz. So in today's Muffin Talk, I'm presenting to you a number of snippets recordings. Snippets of uh, recordings of the last more than 10 years of the radio program. Here it goes. I'm delighted to welcome Beatty to our family of uh, Planet FM. There are many different forms of, of meditation. The form that I was uh, formed in uh, when I was a student is very different from what I practice now. It was very much what we call mental prayer, thinking about God thinking of uh, you know a gospel passage imagining oneself within that and what imagining what God would be saying to me so very much a, a mental process whereas uh, this practice that I follow now is we call a prayer of the heart and the is, is the essential aspect of it is just letting go of all thoughts and doing so by the praying of a mantra or prayer word and the particular prayer word that we use or reckon, that is recommended, it's not essential, uh, is the word Maranatha, which is really the most ancient Christian prayer. So what is the mantra in the Christian world? The, the, the mantra, it's, it's a prayer word simply. And just the simple repetition mm -hmm. of this word. And naturally, you know, when one prays, uh, one, uh, when one is still... Uh, distractions come flooding in <laughs> and uh, as soon as one becomes aware that one is distracted the uh, teaching is to simply go back to just listening to this word and gradually it leads to a greater stillness and the recommendation is that one do, does this uh, twice a day early morning and at the end of the working day prior to eating <laughs> Yeah, it's no good meditating on a full stomach Can you tell me a little bit more about the difference? What is what is the main difference between Christian meditation and other sorts of meditation? Well, people often uh, identify meditation with uh, Eastern practices, Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, they have a, a longer and an unbroken tradition of uh, meditation than we have, certainly in the West. In Eastern Christianity, there is that unbroken tradition tradition might not all practice it but uh, nevertheless they know what it is but in the west yeah we we've lost touch with that so it seems to re-emerge particularly at times creative periods times of uh, breakdown and that's very much why it, it appeals today to people because they can find in this practice come to their own center and in coming to their center they they, they find themselves yeah there's that still point of peace the sense where all, everything is one <laughs> uh, in my own experience that that uh, that, that was uh, very important to find that because it became uh, an anchor at a time when uh, i needed an anchor uh, something to uh, yeah some st stability and matthew is named both apostle and evangelist does this make him even more special i don't think <laughs> i wouldn't i wouldn't put it that way no no i'd say he's one of the unique characters in a sense of the first century 
because he's writing from his own perspective and that then makes him somewhat special but I would think that he has a skill that compares with the skill of Luke but they're really writing for different audiences and therefore you can see what's happening in the early church as each of these individuals works with people and then proclaims the message and sort of defines the message for them they have a different style and a different set of stories a different set of expressions and creedal statements that they're going to rely upon so that would be my response really so saint matthew who was he is this the same saint matthew the tax collector who was eager to meet jesus and invite him into his house was it the same person the saint matthew the evangelist This is the big question, of course, for <laughs> biblical scholars. You know, the debates around Matthew have gone on for a number of years in the modern biblical critical world. So, therefore, there is a sense whereby you'd say, well, perhaps if he's one of these Galilean personalities that is from the north of the Holy Land and he's a fisherman or a type like that or comes from that sort of background, perhaps he wouldn't be quite as skilled as an author and uh, so you'd probably make a distinction about the apostle, strictly speaking, and then the evangelist. But I think in the tradition, we've added another title into the picture and I would put three titles alongside his name, tax collector, apostle, and evangelist. And the way the church then remembers the person called Matthew is to play upon that threefold sense, if you like. And the idea is then that when we look back at the history books, as it were, we find very little information about a number of the early church members. And Matthew is a typical character from the early church that we know little of. So you're the convener of this committee and you're that is focusing on the protection of life, as you said, from its conception to natural death. Yet you're specialized on post-abortion counseling. This means counseling for women who have already had an abortion. Can you tell us more about your work as a counselor? Well, um, very often, in fact, most times, the women who come are actually suicidal. And... Um, Many of them would have spent years trying to figure out what's at the bottom of their heartache. Um, but we have to understand that it's um, obviously we want to protect every single life. And that includes all of the human living people. And all of those women who have been wounded by abortions and, they, and their families, their extended families, their grandparents, their parents, the fathers, those people, they have a need to grieve. And society just doesn't allow them that space and it's remarkable i've seen women grieving a five-week-old fetus just as if it was a five-year-old child you know and um they just need time they need love and they need time and they need to know that that it's important that their grief is important and their child was important and um it's about bringing them to reconciliation to forgive all those people who have hurt them to bring them right through that grief stages there's a lot of anger often and bring them through to forgiving them, those other, other people, often the doctors and the medical staff, and then finally forgiving themselves. Because if they don't forgive themselves, they go through life still damaged and hurting. How important do you think is spirituality in a person's life? Well, uh, it is widely important but today is the uh, society is being missing this I can accuse the individual uh, any persons because of the uh, vast majority of the education system media and the uh, certain uh, type of understanding it's uh, fluxing and the pump up the secular, secular lifestyle more important than the some other important things so the any individual under these circumstances it's difficult to understand spirituality but the spirituality uh, sometimes you don't need to be measured just the 
couple of minutes of the dark room or dark sky. You can feel it. It's screaming your inside. Today's society is big missing. And that's why the many young generations, they try to uh, settle or uh, stop it. They're screaming through the usage of the substance or doing the some nonsense. That spirituality, it's, it's really screaming inside the every individual that says, feed me, understand me and communicate to me. But we don't know the language or communication or connectness of the spirituality of ourselves uh, in a spectrum. We try to solve the problem out of the world. And that's to create the more problem. Like the people are thirsty, need to be drink the water, the satisfaction in other thoroughness. We do more the you know the drinking the salt water. I don't blame the society. The spiritual lifestyle is being screaming to feed me, understand me, communicate me. Instead, we just ignore it and give it to more the materialistic type of lifestyle. Kiribati is located right on the equator uh, in the central Pacific. You can find Kiribati northwest of Hawaii. So when you go to the map, when you see the map, of course, uh, you will see a total Atoll Highlands, 33 Atoll Highlands altogether. 33 uh, Islands? Yeah, 33. 33 Atoll, Atoll Highlands altogether. And only 24, 25 of them are um, uh, Habited by people. So 10 of these atoll islands are not inhabited. That's very really true, yeah. And we have a population of about over 100,000, 102,000 people all together. Um, so th- um, in Kiribati, the weather is um, summer all year round. Um, at 6 o'clock, the, at six, right at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, the sun rises. At 6 o'clock in the afternoon or in the evening, the sun sets. What makes Kiribati really so vulnerable and its inhabitants, of course? Yeah, you're very right. Uh, We are the very forefront of the climate change impact. Uh, Our air to islands are only 1.5 meters above sea level. 1.5 1.5 meters. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, we are very vulnerable to water sea rise due to the effects of climate change that is eroding our foreshores. Many houses and crops, especially the food and water, have been damaged. What, Be- can, what do you grow in Kiribati? Uh, most commonly coconut trees, pantanus trees, uh, breadfruits. Breadfruit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, breadfruits. Yeah. Uh, we have some crops that are kumara yeah, and many others, but um, unfortunately, these uh, gro- crops or the food are being eroded by the water sea rise, affecting the many of the other islands, especially in the South Island. Uh, during um, the king, the the, the, the king died. That's when it is very um, severe because uh, the water comes on the land. People have to relocate their the, where they live, and they have to move. To the inwards, they have to uh, live in the center of the land because uh, living near the beach is not safe because the water sea rise is there. Are there any hills or...? No, Kiribati is flat. As an Atoll Islands, all the Atoll Islands are flat. And as I said, it's only 1.5 meters above sea level. So when a big wave comes... Yeah, you can can say that. When the big wave comes, yeah, that's Mm. it. A future in Kiribati is not certain because Kiribati will disappear from this planet due to rising sea level. And I always come back to that due to rising sea level. And the question is often asked by a lot of our people, who is responsible and how can we make the difference? I guess that the international community has a big responsibility to help compact the effect of climate change and also to help smaller nations in the Pacific, especially Kiribati that we are becoming victims now. The word didache literally means the training. It's the Greek word for training. And 
we, we think of the early church as having things like the letters of Paul and then later having, having documents like the Gospels. But quite apart from these, the letters of Paul were occasional things. They were occasioned by particular needs. And the Gospels are the written down recordings of gospelers who were coming to give a performance, an overview of the whole vision of Christian faith. But the people in the communities, in the local churches scattered all across the Mediterranean world, they needed something that would be their training. And the training began as something very simple and it kept developing and when it was still in the simple stage in the first and second centuries it was something that every disciple of Jesus actually learned off by heart now we knew that this existed because we had lots of references they they had learned the training and they had read the training and they had copied the training and we knew we, we knew everyone said well, what was it like and people said, well, it probably included the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, well, so much. That's, you, you don't have to be brilliant to make that guess. It probably included something like some sort of variant on the Ten Commandments. Well, again, you wouldn't have to be very bright to, to, make, to make that guess. But then, in 1873, a brilliant young Greek monk was working in a library in Constantinople, now Istanbul, cataloging books and the funny thing about this particular librarian was he had already spent a couple of years in Germany and indeed he had there met all of the great editors so as he was going through the book his mind was alerted to be looking out for unusual things and he discovered a copy of the Didache a copy of the Didache that reflects the way the Didache was used in Greek around 80 AD and this is the most precious document we have from the Christians from the first century that's not in the New Testament. And it's even more precious because all of the documents in the New Testament were special documents. This is the ordinary document. This gives us an insight into what was actually happening in a local church at the time. And so, for instance, it's, it's got a very detailed list of do's and don'ts. And then we thought, well, that's very unusual. And then we found in 1947, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, we thought, ah, now we have a copy in Aramaic of the same thing that we find in a Christian document in Greek. And we realized that an awful lot of the moral practice that the Christians were putting forward to these Greek converts to the religion of Jesus wasn't yet called Christianity in the first, in the middle of the first century they're actually using a document that was being used for training little Jewish boys and girls back in Palestine which we had also lost human beings are almost incurably religious even if they're not very obviously religious or even if they say they're not religious there is this somehow sense that there's something there's something larger there's mystery and once you once you actually say there is mystery you seek to address it and it's that address that's prayer where Christian prayer comes in is that Jews and Christians and Muslims would say that there is a dialogue between God and the individual and between dialogue and the human family and that dialogue takes the form of the invitation to pray and so all three religions have had structures for prayer based on culture and history um, of the times, if you look at it, there's a clear reason why women are marginalized in the Bible. And, and then if they are there, it's in spite of the fact that culturally and in historical context would leave them out. So you need to understand that when they are there, they couldn't get away with not mentioning them because you wouldn't be able to understand the story without them in it. But in general, they weren't meant to be there because the way the Bible, if you unpack it, 
is talking about things is very tribal. So in other words, Abraham represents a man, but he represents much more than a man. He was a community of people who were connected to his family. It was him, his wife, his kids, um, his father, his um, all of his servants, and the people who thought well, what he was saying was cool, and they all moved as an enclave. People didn't travel by themselves in the desert in the time it was very unsafe to do that so whenever you see individuals they're actually representative of a group so abraham was a tribe and his sons were each time a tribe and all of jacob's sons were tribes and tribes were never named after a woman they were named after men it was a patriarchal society My generation, we lived up. We lived in fear of the Cold War, you know, of uh, the, the nuclear bomb and all this. Um, for a later generation, it, after two thousand and one, yeah, September eleventh, uh, it was fear of terrorism. Today, yeah, it's climate change, yeah, which many of the fifteen, sixteen, seventeen year olds are extremely worried about. And 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 yes, we try to listen to that in Teze. And to try to understand what is God saying to us through through this these concerns. I saw a real need for um, songs for primary school children, which were accessible to them musically and lyrically, but they still had uh, some theological depth to them. So when I was uh, when I started teaching in the early eighties, a lot of the songs that in primary schools we sang were sort of I call them the, the rainbow daffodil and butterfly songs, and they were cute and they were fun and they were good for religious education, but. We kind of tried to squeeze them in to make them gathering songs or communion songs, and they weren't, you know. So I thought, surely we can get music which is still attractive and accessible to children, but it actually matches what we're trying to do liturgically and theologically. So that's what started me off. It's the Pietà by Michelangelo. What do we know about the creation of this masterpiece? Indeed, thanks, Beate. It was um, originally commissioned by a French cardinal who was the papal ambassador, the French ambassador to Rome. Um, and Rome at the time was the capital of the papal state. So it was commissioned by the cardinal for the French chapel in the old St. Peter's Basilica, the basilica built by Constantine in the 4th century for his for the cardinal's uh, funeral piece. So it would have been a, an extraordinary work of art unprecedented in its time in Rome being a high renaissance work of a Florentine sculptor um, in what it was essentially a, an old medieval basilica. Um, so the Pope at the time was uh, Rodrigo Borgia Pope Alexander VI so the French cardinal was commissioning it uh, to a Florentine sculptor again uh, for a piece in Rome so it was a very important work for Michelangelo because he was young uh, at the time when he got the commission, he was only 23 in 1498 um, and um, he was now coming to Rome uh, to a city that uh, he would not have been well known in to do a work of art for, for a, a French ambassador. I consider a song is just like a monologue. It just obviously has the heightened nature of music underneath. But you still need all of the storytelling skills and great connection to the audience when you're singing as if you're acting. So for me, whether it is on any type of production, I'm always really, you know, looking at the character and their journey. I would say I probably get my most satisfaction from the stage because I like being able to complete the full story in that one evening. 
Whereas when you're shooting a film or a television series, you're often doing things out of order. Um, you know, you might be doing scenes from the last episode on your first day. So you really have to have a sense of where you've come from and where you're going to as a character. But I love the variety. I think in New Zealand you don't get pigeonholed, and that's really, really, really wonderful. So it means, it means I've really had such a, a wide variety in my, in my career, and long may that last. You know, older and bolder, trying things, that's, that's mostly what I'm interested in, is new, exciting experiences. Maybe you can just, again, clarify the difference between ecumenism and interfaith. Sure, sure. Well, ecumenism, which derives from a Greek word, oikumene, meaning the whole inhabited earth, or the sense of being together, and was a movement that began or emerged out of the late 19th century when initially Christian missionaries from different organizations and different churches began to ask the question, why are we competing with one another? In, in the missionary field, in terms of evangelical conversion, we're all trying to bring them to bring people to the same Lord, but we're doing it through different routes and it becomes confusing. Ecumenism came out of the context of trying to resolve issues, competitive praxis and so on, relating to a diversity of Christian denominational identities. So, so that's ecumenism is actually, you might say, crossing borders and boundaries and evolving relationships within the diversity of one religious tradition. And although the, the term was coined within Christianity, you can, by analogy, apply it into other religious contexts as well. Uh, whereas interreligious engagement, dialogue, or interfaith activities or whatever are across the main religious identities and religions themselves, however they may be expressed. Son of David, son of Abraham. Now, I couldn't think of a better way of going into the New Testament than the genealogy that tells us all about the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. So the whole thing is that the New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament. I mean, if we don't know the Old Testament, they're just a list of meaningless names, but they're there for a purpose to establish the identity of Jesus. This, of course, is the most Jewish of the gospel, and there are genealogies right through the Old Testament. Genesis 10 is a, genea is a genealogy. The sort of the ancestry, we all carry the ancestry of others, of the past, and that establishes our identity now. If we want to know who Jesus is, we go to his own scriptures. And there's such a, it's a list of names, sure, but it's got a purpose. So, Brother Chair, would you compare it to like a whakapapa? Absolutely, because a whakapapa establishes the identity of someone today in terms of their past. And really, unless we appreciate the story of the Hebrew scriptures, then how can we appreciate the one who is the fulfillment of them.